Alameda, California, Jan and Ray Burton are a liberal couple and live their lives peacefully. Francisco, be sure to wear Jan is a teacher for disabled children while Ray is a highway engineer. On February 10, 1962, their third son was born, Clifford Lee. He takes from his parents a quiet character and a unique style. The Burton family relocates to the famous San Francisco Bay Area. Here, Ray introduces Cliff to classical music, making him begin piano lessons at the age of six. As a teenager, Cliff expands his musical horizons, going from classical to jazz, and eventually to heavy metal as well. Cliff has a brother Scott and a sister Connie. On May 19, 1975, tragedy strikes the Burton family. Scott David Burton dies at the age of 16 while being rushed to the hospital after having a brain aneurysm. This tragic event deeply touches the young Cliff, giving him life enthusiasm and generosity that will characterize him forever. In fact, after the death of his brother, Cliff begins to play bass painstakingly. His parents remember him saying, I want to be the greatest bass player for my brother, and he practiced up to six hours a day. I started playing in uh, 1976. What are, what are some of your influences? Well, first off, the bass playing it would be Geddy Lee, Geezer Butler, uh, Stanley Clark. Yeah, Lemmy had also an influence on the way he uses distortion. Yeah, yeah. That was, uh, that was different. And also, certain guitar players had an influence. You know, people like, uh, um, well, everything Finn Lizzy did has had an influence. Yeah, uh, Phil was great. Jimi Hendrix, Ulrich Roth, Shanker to a little degree, uh, maybe Tony Iommi, they also had an influence. While still a student at the Castro Valley High School, Cliff Burton formed his first band, Easy Street. Cliff is joined by his friends Jim Martin and Mike Bourdain, better known later as the guitarist and drummer of Faith No More. Taking the name of a strip club in the San Mateo Bay Area, Easy Street have in their repertoire both original material and covers from The Rolling Stones, Led Zeppelin, and Black Sabbath. I used to jam around with some local friends. Uh, then I got together with uh, these guys who called themselves Easy Street. It was named after a strip joint. <laughs> they got music on the tail. Uh, it was all kind of weird shit, but it was silly actually. Uh, did a lot of covers, was really shit. Uh, I was with them for a while, for a few years. Cliff is truly a special guy with a detailed intelligence. He loves his music, which he practices religiously, but at the same time, he loves nature and hanging out with friends. It's a mutual friend which introduces Cliff to Jim Martin and recommends him as a talented bass player. Jim and Cliff bind quickly. They spend a lot of time together with Dave Donato and often isolate themselves in the Maxwell Ranch which is in the hills around San Francisco and owned by Jim's family. It's a place out of this world, wild, and they're the only people for miles. Here the guys enter a new dimension, made of great dichotomies. Fun and fear, harmony and torment, creative discoveries and bold experiments. They can turn on a power generator and crank up the volume. They drink beer, shoot rifles, and smoke pot. They often record what they play, and the music is certainly not easy listening. One day Cliff's mother hears one of the recordings and snaps, You guys sound like fucked up weirdos. Cliff loves the Maxwell Ranch because he can give full vent to his talent and creativity without limits or rules. The diaries kept are drawn of horrific visions and report the chronicles of the time spent being alienated to the point of sounding like a poem by Allen Ginsberg. 
Max was a big place and a long ways from here. The blind woman and armless man put it there for killing and solitude. No water, no electricity, no kindness. The bay's dry box guarded by wasps surrounds the crap hole dug by society's goodness. Technology provides access and security. Escape. Jim took me there in 1981. We crossed over in his father's truck and began to experiment. Our theories confirmed in isolation and suspicion. It was encouraging and further research was condemned. In 1982, something unexpected happened. The silver box worked. Radio Shack provided the evidence to persuade others. One evening, in a haze of smoke and booze, Jim keyed the lock and opened the gate. I noticed a glitch causing fear and exposure. This one was created as a stronghold for our souls. Cliff needed to be informed and protected, but he'd already planned to go. The silver box was positioned that we began. Slow at first, testing, bong binges, followed with silver bullets and more. We were rolling, guilty and proud. We bashed our way to the cabin. Huge boulders wedged between us and them were primitively defeated with pick and steel. They were not prepared. We had a plan, a mission. We would not be denied. Unloading the gear, Cliff took it all in. So this is it. Nope, not yet. Wait, you'll see soon enough, Cliff. The sun was high and hot, but hadn't burnt the lush green earth yet. We were lucky and confident. We made it in and didn't care if we made it out. Without wasting any more time, the Klingon was packed full and consumed. A huge bellowing cloud of smoke floated quietly above our heads and slowly drifted away. This is the place, Cliff. I can see it, Kim. Welcome to the Maxwell Cliff O. The band has a short lifespan, but Cliff and Jim continue with their musical collaboration in a new band with Dave Donato. Agents of Misfortune, entering in the competition, Battle of the Bands in 1981. And Agents of Misfortune. Well, how do you guys think you did tonight? Pretty all right, I think. Pretty fair. You did pretty fair, huh? Yeah, I feel good about it. I think we did great. Um, well, in listening to you guys, I would say that you have a real heavy, heavy metal sound. Um, what kind of Influence, um, rock influences have you had in music? Rush, uh, Pink Floyd, Velvet Underground, maybe a uh, little Black Sabbath. Uh, Just about everyone. And you see all the guys. Just, we twist them all up. And... Um, are you guys more geared for concerts or clubs? Concerts. Would you say? Definitely concerts. No clubs. Unless the club was extremely open minded in their musical <laughs> attitudes. So what do you hope to get out of being here, um, auditioning at the Battle of the Bands, if you make it? I mean, what do you want out of this? Well, we've already accomplished our goal, pretty much, wouldn't you guys say? I'd say so. Yeah. If we, uh, we had fun. If we happened to make the Battle of the Bands, it would be icing on the cake. So you guys are just here to have a good time and show them what's on the other side of the people. fence. Yeah, just uh, show them what's on the other side of the fence. Yeah, by all means. Well, that's a really positive attitude, and uh, this is Agents of Misfortune, and good luck, you guys. Thank thanks thank for you. being with us. Okay, thanks a lot. Thank you. The band plays an instrumental piece with no compromise, psychedelic and extreme, and it's one of the earliest video recordings of Cliff Burton and of what would become his trademark style. In fact, the video hides some parts, which soon afterwards become two songs by Metallica. His incredible solo, Anesthesia, and Antif, and a chromatic intro to For Whom the Bell Tolls.
Uh, 20 years old, Cliff is so convinced of his ability that he tells his parents he is determined to become a professional bass player. His parents agree to help him, paying him room and board for four years, after which, if he hasn't achieved satisfactory goals, he must find a new job. I've seen trauma and said, well, might as well do that. In 1982, Cliff joins his first major band, Trauma, a very promising group of the Bay Area that are known for spectacular performances. Among the glamour and the theatrics of his bandmates, Cliff is still what stands out most. Always dressed with denim bell bottoms, he unleashes on stage dizzying performances and a constant headbanging evident by his long, wild red mane. Trauma, Cliff records the demo of the song Such a Shame, which will also be published in the compilation Metal Massacre 2 by Brian Slagle. In Trauma plays the Whiskey A Go Go in Los Angeles. Among the audience there are two young musicians, James Hetfield and Lars Ulrich of Metallica. Lars had asked me, they were kind of looking around for another bass player, and he asked me if I knew anybody. I said, well, why don't you guys come down and see this band Trauma at the Troubadour? They're pretty cool. I think you might like the bass player. Trauma went down to L.A. and did some stuff. And when I was in L.A., I got a Lars and James uh, saw us. It was San Francisco Metal Night at the Whiskey in L.A., and uh, me and James went down there. Say hi to Cliff! And we looked down on the stage, we heard this wild solo going on. There's this big mop of red hair going nuts, you know? And it was a wah sound. It's like, man, that guitar is heavy. And we look, and we're counting the strings on it. Dude, that's a bass. That was this guy, Cliff Burton. Me and James had never seen anything like him. And we just looked at each other and said, we have to get this guy in our band. And his head banging on stage, I mean, nobody banged like him. It was insane. I remember the first time I saw them play with him, I was like, oh my God, look at that guy. The next day after a performance, he would, he would get up and, oh God, my neck, I can't understand. <laughs> Cliff, what do you mean? <laughs> your neck, you're bouncing your head up and down all night long, you wonder why your neck hurts. So. Uh, but anyway, he kind of smiled. Impressed by the incredible style of Cliff Burton, they asked him to join their band the very same evening. So we stuck around and we pulled him aside and said, you are amazing, we gotta steal you. Cliff quickly declines the offer, but his role with Trauma is becoming more and more dissatisfying. And uh, decided that they would, uh, would like to have me in their band, and so, they started getting a hold of me, calling me, and I came to their shows here, and they played disco. Mm -hmm. They called me for about six months, and finally I decided really? that was the thing to do. It was the hip scene, huh? Yeah. Well, <laughs> trauma got a bit boring. Yeah. That was a pretty good tune on Metal Mask, though. Yeah, but uh, they started to change, you know. Yeah. Like, uh, let's be commercial so everyone will like us. Different general musical attitudes that 
You want to found uh, very annoying. You want to get heavier. Definitely. Mm -hmm. and and then what? You told you told them that uh, they had to move up here if you're going to join or something. Like that? Yeah, yeah. I told them that that they would have to move up here because I wasn't about to move down to LA. Yeah, I didn't nice. like it up here. Yeah, it's cool. Cliff's parents remember, Trummel wanted to strongly resize him, but he wanted to play solos on the bass, but the others told him, absolutely not. Two years after the famous agreement with his parents, Cliff decides to make a change and join Metallica, but on two conditions. First, that the band moves to the Bay Area because Los Angeles is too trendy and unsuitable for a guy like him. And second, that he can play bass solos. You know, after six months of courting him, it, it just came to, to the point where he would join the band on that one condition, which was, if we wanted him in the band, the talent goes to Northern California. L.A. sucks! We really had no problem with that. L.A. wasn't treating us very well at all. So they said, yeah, well, we were thinking about doing that anyway. So they came up and we uh, got together here in this uh, this room that we're sitting in now, <laughs> set up the gear, and blasted it out for a couple of days, and it was pretty obvious straight away that yeah. uh, you know, it, was, it was a good thing to do. Cliff's mother, Jan, recalls, when they finally got together, Cliff said, I want to play the bass solo. I want a space where I can explode. They answered, You can play anything you want as long as you join us. They gave him a good five minute long solo. We just moved all the furniture out of the house and invite 50 headbanging friends over, put venom on the stereo, and just thrash the place, you know? By the time we walk in the club, we just be like, metal rules! That guy's got a blonde stripe in his hair. Kill him, kiss that Motley Crue creep. There was kids with denim jackets on that had Metallica patches on the back, and the support band was playing, and they, they turned around, they turned their backs on them, and were standing there doing this, you know? And it's like, wow, they're loyal to us. They're our people. Metallica was completely different. They were street. It was just t-shirts, jeans, let's get down to business. Let's not screw around. Now why should we change We're on stage? You know, we're not trying to be something big and fancy, you know? We didn't fit in with the music scene in LA. We did up in San Francisco. I mean, in LA, you get drinks with umbrellas in them. Up in San Francisco, it's, it's a beer can. It was a much grittier atmosphere. So we went right up there instantly. <laughs> Dave was outspoken, did a lot of talking into the microphone, which I thought was very unusual for a guy who was not singing at all. He was playing the role of bad boy, uh, and he, he played it well. I mean, he was a pretty scary guy. On March 5th, 1983, Cliff plays his first show with Metallica at the Stone in San Francisco. And then on March 16th, Metallica records their last demo with Dave Mustaine. The only demo where Cliff and Dave are playing together. The demo is meant to introduce Cliff to potential record labels and is also played live on KUSF in San Francisco thanks to their friend Ron Quintana, who's a prominent DJ there. The demo contains two new songs previously unleashed, Whiplash and No Remorse. I had never heard like such a twin rhythm guitar kind of deal going on. Their music just had more speed or something to it. It blew me away. You couldn't read about it in, in mainstream magazines. You couldn't hear it on the radio. Certainly there was no MTV or, or videos. It was really about a network. However, it's no life to leather that circulates everywhere in the metal community. A freak metalhead named Johnny Z. Zazula, owner of Rock and Roll Heaven, goes nuts about the tape and is hell-bent to make Metallica record for his label, Megaforce, in New York. Our brand of music known as heavy metal has come over the years. 
The specialized sound is geared to attract a certain type of audience, young teens. And Annabon found a store that makes its money selling records with songs about death, the devil, and destruction. Nestled in a quiet New Jersey town is a little store called Rock and Roll Heaven. One day I was up at uh, Rock and Roll Heaven, which then wasn't Rock and Roll Heaven. It was uh, the East Brunswick Flea Market, and Johnny and Marsha Z were actually sub-renting a guy's store, and it didn't even have a name for it. I met John and Marsha there, started hanging out, and then the word got out for all the metalheads that, uh, you know, this store was here, and all the underground metalheads uh, were coming out like cockroaches to light and saying, hey, this is a cool place, why don't we start hanging out there? And then after a while, uh, Johnny Z pretty much uh, took the, the place over that he was renting from the guy, I guess you could say he bought him out. And uh, it uh, became known as Rock and Roll Heaven, and everybody used to hang out there. Johnny used to get the coolest magazines like Kerrang! from England. And he used to get like cool EPs, uh, picture discs in the good old days when he had vinyl, and he used to put images on vinyl, and all the hard to get stuff. And right around that time was around 1980, 81, and uh, the new wave of British heavy metal was pretty much coming over from England to the States. You had like Motorhead, uh, the first album, and then you had uh, Priest Breaking over here, uh, Iron Maiden, which, uh, you know, the Killers album with the Anno and stuff was, was pretty awesome. It's starting to move up there. It's, it's, you know, bands are getting signed to major labels, and it just, it's a type of music that can't be ignored anymore. And then, uh, you know, every weekend it seemed like more and more people were going there and hanging out. It was like a, a social thing. I remember uh, that the Haight-Ashbury area in San Francisco had like the Grateful Dead, uh, Jefferson Airplane, and all those big, band, and the big bands back there. That was kind of like our Haight-Ashbury for metal, you know, going over a rock and roll heaven, everybody just hanging out. And from there, it kind of progressed. Uh, Johnny Z also had his first concert at a, a rock and roll heaven which was at uh, the flea market at route 18 in east brunswick we had anvil come into the states for the first time thing was that Anvil got stopped in the border coming over from Canada to the US and you know they got a lot of bondage gear and lips plays with a lot of dildos so we were hanging over at Johnny's house today which is at 60 York Street in Old Bridge which was another place that went, it was like a hate Ashbury area you never knew who was gonna be hanging out at Johnny's house so lips goes to Marsha hey Marsha they confiscated some of my gear uh, I hate to ask a personal question to you, but do you have a certain uh, female pleasure device? And she said, sure, you know, take your pick. So Lips got one of his, one of the dildos or, you know, vibrators, what you want to call them, and he was able to play that night. And then they, one day Johnny got a, a demo tape in the mail, and he says, uh, check it out, you know, let me know what you think of it. He goes, it's by this band Metallica. And he goes, I never heard of them before of you. I go, no. He goes, this is a demo tape. Uh, let me know what you check, you know, what me do you think of it and check it out. So he puts it in this little tiny cassette player. And, you know, I heard Hit the Lights, as you can destroy on a cassette that was pretty much just made in someone's garage. And I heard it for the first time and it was like, you know, totally blown away. It was like I had uh, my first eargasm, you know. Metallica was the answer to America's prayers. They were the first band we heard that really made America look good. They gave good. the American hang, headbang or something to hang their hat on. And he says, uh, I, said, I said to John, I said, this is, this is definitely incredible. It's like a hybrid, like punk uh, meeting metal. And you had the heaviness of the metal, but you, you had the speed of the punk. And from what it seemed, that, that they had some attitude with them, too. Johnny, uh, a couple weeks later, is uh, talking to me about it and goes, what would you think if I wanted to start a record company and get these guys as my first uh, artist on my label? I said, I think that would be incredible. But he's telling me that he like had a second mortgage, or excuse me, put a second uh, loan or get a second mortgage on his house in order to afford this. Johnny raises some funds to pay the band's travel expenses going coast to coast to New York in a U-Haul. The back went down and... 
you were locked in there, and whatever happened back there, you know, if you could afford a flashlight, you were king, you know. <laughs> but there was no light, no anything back there. You just get rotted and sleep. You know, hopefully, I hope the gear didn't fall and crush you. <laughs> Problems with the members are not over. Dave Mustaine shows his overly aggressive and dangerous behavior because of his drug and alcohol addiction. When we left San Francisco, everything was fine. When we got to New York, ten days later, things were less uh, hunky-dory in the band, and, and obviously it was the first time that we had all lived together, shared, a, you know, been sort of locked and sharing a very small amount of space, and we realized, unfortunately, um, that things were probably not going to work out with Dave. While I was in the back of this truck, rust came down from the ceiling and got in my eyes. I said, I got to get to an emergency room because I've got metal shavings in my eyes. And they didn't want to stop till we got to Old Bridge. On our way out to the East Coast, we were staying at connections of friends and Dave. He was trashing their houses and just really disrespecting stuff. And you know, we drank a lot. God, did we drink a lot. But Dave had sides to him when he was drunk that was not positive. <laughs> The journey from San Francisco to New York opens everyone's eyes on Dave's problems, so the band takes the dramatic decision to kick him out. There's two kinds of drunks. There's happy drunks and there's violent drunks. And I would get violent. He just went like totally psycho on some people in this restaurant and almost caused this big fight. We started to see that he was on the road to killing possibly all of us. I think especially Cliff thought that Dave Mustaine was just like out of his mind. It was gonna bring us all down. We had to put an end to it. We're playing tapes in the cab of the truck while he's asleep in the back on some stained mattress. And that was the whole ugliness of that U-Haul trip. If you ever wake up and the other three band members are sitting, you know, within two feet of you, staring at you as you're rubbing sleep out of your eyes, probably not a good sign. And literally, we walked into Johnny Z's place. We got to his house, and we all crashed on his couch, and blah, blah, blah. And we walked in, and basically the first thing was like, you know, um, yeah, we gotta, I gotta, just got to tell you something. Hi, nice to meet you. How you doing? You nice family, nice kids. So, <laughs> and Johnny Z was like, you know, it was like, whoa, that was a big shock. All I remember was waking up and then being circled around me, and I just looked up. Wake up, Dave, you know. Get up, you're, you're out of the band. And I said, what, no warning, no second chance? It was almost like execution style. We just walked in, woke him up, fired him, grabbed him in his shit, and took him down to the bus stop. And the whole thing took, you know, 45 minutes. It does sound <laughs> pretty bad, you know, wake up, bye. But it really had to happen that way. When's my plane leave? Uh, <laughs> Well, you're spending the next four days on a Greyhound bus that leaves in 45 minutes to pack your together and let's go to the bus station before you even know what hit you. And that was that. I remember this like it was yesterday. I was sitting in the back of James's pickup when they drove me to the bus station. And I looked at James and he was weeping. You know, we were brothers up to that point and then something had pulled us apart and uh, we knew it had to continue that way, so it was emotional for all of us. I'd seen my dad in a coma and, and dying, and, and this was probably more harmful to me than anything I'd ever been through.